It's time for the newspaper review. This is where Sally and I look at the stories. She already is left. I'm reading them. I'm reading them. I promise you. Well, this is where we look at the headlines <laughs> that have been made around the world. Let's begin, <coughs> of course, with this tragic image. We've seen it over the weekend of bodies ready for burial in Hula. Um, it's dominating the International Herald Tribune and many newspapers around the world. Uh, the International Herald Tribune is carrying both the UN denunciation of the attack and the Syrian government's denial that it was responsible for the massacre. Now, Christine Lagarde's charge against the Greeks is the headline in Le Figaro, which covers the continuing fallout from the head of the IMF's comments that uh, Greeks should help themselves by paying their taxes. El Pais says that Bankia's parent group will announce the greatest losses in Spanish financial history. In The Guardian, the front page has an investigation on it into the illegal kidney trade uh, revealed by the World Health Organization. It estimates that 10,000 organs are now traded every year, equating to one every hour. Enough to feed 48,001 child families. Now, that's according to the South China Morning Post, which is looking at how much edible food is dumped by Hong Kong's major supermarkets every day. And what a catch. Check that out. This is the Irish Times. It shows a very happy Welshman who caught a brown trout weighing a whopping 23 pounds, 12 ounces. It's not the record, though, apparently. The biggest ever was a 32 pounder caught in 2002. I bet he was gutted that it wasn't the biggest. It's not exactly a tiddler, though, is it? No, but you kind of want to break the records please. when you drag one of those in, don't you? Oh. Anyway, joining us <laughs> now is Bandeep Singh Rangar, uh, Chairman of Industry. Good to have you with us, Bandeep. Um, the pictures over the weekend that came out, um, this massacre on Friday, distressed so many people, um, not surprisingly so, particularly those so affected by the fact that so many children were killed um, in this. And it has pushed the agenda, hasn't it? Because there's been a lot of pressure on the UN um, to take action. We've got William Hay going over to Russia today as part of a plan visit, but obviously to try to change perhaps Russia's mind when it comes to the UN. Um, but it seems that whatever happens, Syria is just not listening. And this might be just a pivotal point there because you, you can't dispute what you see when 32 children are killed, cold-blooded, some with their, with their torso, which is uh, obviously mm. extremely tragic. Um, and with the UN backing up the Amman plan, now hopefully Russia moves over to the other side and kind of puts more pressure because they have an incredible amount of influence on Syria. They're one of the few countries that are supporting Syria, and it's one reason why Syria is able to kind of stand up for the rest of the world and still hold up, well, not Syria, but the Syrian regime. Um, so this is a good chance to get a real change there because in the, in the absence of that, this is going to continue. And we've talked in the past about how this goes to sectarian violence. The Free Syrian Army has now called off the ceasefire, so that's an alarming step. Uh, and there's continued support for the, for the rebels. So I think this is a very, very dangerous step unless um, this becomes a real catalyst for change. If it doesn't, as you say, the um, fear is that there'll be revenge massacres and the violence will see no end. And the regime itself, the only risk of the regime crumbling is over a period of months, maybe even years in the future. Yeah, this is not where you've got the uh, UN-backed uh, air cover support for the rebels. You don't see what you saw in, in Libya, for example. And you don't see the, the popular upsurge of Egypt, because you just are not allowed that. So I think the, 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 the only alternative is long protracted conflict and sectarian violence. Uh, unless there's a very concerted international effort and an armed intervention of some sort. Now, Bandi, give us your take on uh, Christine Lagarde, head of the IMF, and her comments about Greece in Le Figaro, the French newspaper we're looking at today. It describes it as a shock interview on Greece. Do you think it was shocking? Well, I think that her comments in the, in the face of the fact that um, there's always been a question about the tax payments in Greece, I think in the context of the austerity measures and making sure that Greeks are borrowing now in order to be able to pay in the future can only be there if the public purse is being well fed and that goes out of the tax system. Having said that, I do think her, one of the things her comments are probably taken a bit out of context and somewhat extreme because she's comparing them to children in Africa, which is a bit of a stark contrast when you look at, you know, the, the, kind of what she's trying to make a, a point of here. Um, so 
I guess the net net is she's trying to say the wealthy should be taxed and they should be paying their fair taxes, uh, not that Greeks on large or certainly the public sector people are paying their fair share of taxes and people may be misconstruing that a lot looking at the 7,000 odd comments that went online after comments went on, on, on the Guardian side. It has been though, argued by many and the point's been made many, many times prior to her interview that in Greece the culture that uh, taxes are not paid, etc., etc., that that is part of the problem, that the government is not getting in the tax revenues it perhaps should do, particularly from the wealthy. Uh, that's the point, right? So then the question is, does the government look at improving transparency? And I've always said this, one way to do it is just say give an amnesty to people and say, look, whatever the past is, clear it out, no prosecution based on that. And that's one way to get people past the hurdle of saying, well, if we now declare taxes, you'll have a back <laughs> backlog of and a backtracking of past payments that have not been made. So one way to get past is to say, look, give an amnesty, get people to come up to speed, and then create a clear and transparent system because Greeks need that. You can't have mm -hmm. a shrinking economy of now 4.1 percent shrinking and support borrowing in the future. That's going to affect your kids more to this. Let's whisper through the next few. Um, Bankia um, expected to announce some record losses. They're massive. Yeah, three billion in losses there, and uh, more importantly, I think if you look at what's being done, this is like their fourth attempt in three years to restructure the banks. And last year they said, you know, lenders should merge and unlisted lenders should effectively go public. Well, Bankia did uh, last July, and of course their share price is nearly 60% down since then, and now they've lost got a, got a loss. That's going to cost some heads to roll. You've already seen the board of Bankia, and now you see the parent uh, bailout fund, which is going to do the same. And I guess now the main thing is that is Spain can't afford to borrow the way it could in the past. The cost of borrowing for Spain is now up to about 7%, which is the same sort of benchmark what triggered off the bailouts in Portugal and Greece. So you've got a risk of this becoming a systemic issue if, they, if it becomes too expensive. So now Greece, uh, sorry, they have to, Spain has to tap into their public purse. And that's taxpayer money looking to help out the banks as opposed to the international capital markets or the European uh, Union in some way, shape or form. And that makes it more and more dangerous for the taxpayer. Time is tight, but we have to talk about this fish. It's <laughs> massive. And we all like a wombat first thing in the morning. Are you a fisherman? Uh, no, but I'm going salmon fishing this summer uh, in Vancouver, so this could be something to try and beat. And I know what that's like? one fish. A trout caught in the Rondon Valley. It talks about salmon fishing in, in Vancouver. <laughs> something to aspire to. From Sally and myself, Randy, thank you very Thanks, much. Thank it's goodbye for now. Bye bye.